Hey everyone, welcome to my second of two videos on this, the Cambo SCN2. And before we get into this video, it's very, a very good idea if you have seen my video on how to load 4x5 film into film backs and also how the anatomy of a 4x5 lens. The descriptions are in the, the, the links rather are in the description. If you haven't seen those, pause this video and take a look at them because some of the information in those videos will be crucial to understanding what I'm about to say if this is your first time really looking at 4x5 cameras. So the first thing is we're gonna talk about how to mount and unmount lenses on this camera. However, I do not have any lenses in a Cambo board right now because I'm not actively using this camera. So bear with me, we're gonna pretend that I have a lens in this board. So this camera is gonna to have to have leaf shutter lenses. The only possible exception to that is if you have a barrel lens and you wanna do a, um, like a star trails at night and after dark you can take the shutter off and then put it back on. Or if you're doing things like wet plate where you're in the dark, I mean, you, you could theoretically use a barrel lens on these. It's just a lot more trouble than it's really worth. So in general, stick to the leaf shutter lenses and you'll be happy. So let's pretend there's a leaf shutter lens mounted into this Cambo lens board. These are huge lens boards. Cambo made a bunch of different lens boards that had adapters for other boards. I have one for the Calumet board, but I don't have any lenses in Calumet boards either. So if you had, let's say, a Technica board, I believe there was an adapter to put Technica boards in a Cambo board, and that way you wouldn't have to buy and keep switching your lenses in and out of different sets of boards. You could just buy the one adapter. So you put the lens in here so that the bottom clips in, and then you're going to slide this retainer over to the middle position. Over, there we go, to the middle position. And now this is held in place. There are two little pop-up doodads on top of this retainer here. When you can feel both of them, the lens board is in place and the bellows is in place. To unmount a lens, if you wanna switch it out and put in a different one, the process is the opposite. You push down on the little pop-up doodad, and you slide, let's see if I can do this so you can actually see it. Push down the pop-up doodad, slide this guy over to the side, and now you can take the lens board off and put on a different lens. If you're gonna load film, you've gotta have a film back with film in it. To load the film, you just open the spring back like that, put the film back into the camera, close the spring back gently, Film back is in there tightly. We're going to open up the film back by pulling out the dark slide. I'm just gonna let it rest there with the dark slide just resting on top of the slot that it's gonna be pushed into. This is a really good way to make sure that you don't get light leaks, especially if you have older dark slides where the, the felt material might be degrading. I almost never take my dark slide all the way out of the camera, uh, the film back rather, and just let it rest so that there's a little bit of tension to keep it from falling out, but it's not allowing light to get through if the, the felt is degraded. Gonna come over here, take our picture, click, and once we've taken our picture, we're gonna put the dark slide back down, and there we go, remove it, and then you can take the same picture again if you wanna have a backup picture, a lot of four by five photographer, large format in general photographers, like to have the same picture on each side, just in case something happens to one of them, they have a backup copy. It's twice as much, but it's also good insurance, and it's not really that expensive if you're doing this seriously and have taken the time to invest in a large format system. For flash use with the Cambo SCN2 here, all of that's done on the lenses. So if you saw my 4x5 lens video, the flash sync port is here. And because this is a leaf lens and the leaves have to open all the way and then close all the way every time they take a picture, the flash sync on a leaf shutter for a large format lens will work at any speed. So whatever shutter speeds are available to you on your leaf shutter, you can use your flash at that speed. And then of course, if you uh, are shooting this and you decide you wanna go to portrait orientation, you can just by flipping the back around. But let's say that you want to shoot 
a wide angle lens because you're going to be shooting architecture or something like that, which really benefits from a wide angle lens. Well, this bellows is wonderful. There's no denying that. It's absolutely fantastic. However, if you bring this in as closely as you can, you don't really get a whole lot of movement because your bellows is pretty stiff. So, if you're going to use a wide angle lens, you need to have a bag bellows. First thing we've got to do is we've got, we have to take this bellows off. The lens board and film back retaining clip is also the bellows retaining clip. When it's resting in the middle, like this one is right now, it will retain a lens board in there, which you can do and swap the bellows out, I'll show you. You can quite safely have a lens in here while you're swapping the bellows out if you are mindful of the back of the rear cell of the lens and don't catch it with the bellows when you take the bellows off the camera. To remove the bellows, you're going to push the detent down on the top here that is not for the lens board and slide it. So when this is in the middle, these little drop down bits front and back are holding the lens board and the bellows in place. Slide it all the way over to this, this side with the red dot and you can remove the um, lens board. On the back of this, there's another red dot and if you slide the red dot over to the side here, you can now remove the bellows. So we're going to do the same thing on the top here. And now we've removed the bellows from the camera. So this is a bag bellows right here. It looks like, as you can see, a bellows. This one, when I got it, this whole seam had come undone. One of the great things about buying used camera gear is that sometimes you get to learn how to fix it. It smells like the glue that I used to fix it five years ago. Anyway, the bellows go in exactly like the lens boards do. And you simply drop the bottom. Nope, that's not it. Had that rotated 90 degrees. There are two cutouts, by the way, in the lens boards and the bellows. These go to the top on the, on the whatever you're putting in. So I'm going to put the bellows in. Come on. The back here. And I'm going to Hopefully, get the, there we go, now it's fitting in there. These are a little bit fiddly to put in because they're wider than the standards. Now we'll do the same in the front. There we go, it's all clipped in. Now let's unlock the standards, bring them back together again. And we're gonna get significantly more movement, especially if we move the standards forward a little bit. We can get some good movement in here. Lock it in place. Bring the standard back to infinity focus. And there we go. The bag bellows also, because it's wider, with the standard bellows, if you're using movements with a wide angle lens, those bellows can get into the frame when you look through the, the ground glass or when you take your picture. The bag bellows offers the addition of having all of the um, folds being outside the image area. So even if you're using extreme movements with a wide angle lens, the bag bellows is going to stay out of the frame and you won't end up with parts of your frame cut off by your bellows. That's another major advantage to this when using wide angle lenses. And of course, just because they're four wide angle lenses, that doesn't mean that's the only time you can use them if you tend to shoot wide to normal, as long as you don't need to extend past the, the bag bellows length. You can leave these on a little bit. Um, if you're shooting more like normal to telephoto, then it's a good idea to, to make sure you always have the standard bellows on. Standard bellows tend to be easier to use for the majority of lenses. Bag bellows tend to be easier to use for wide angle lenses. Let's say that you wanted to use some movements on this camera. I mentioned that this camera has a full range of movements. On this side, what would be your left hand? You unscrew this to, to loosen the tilt. And then 
Tilting is always kind of a pain. There we go. And then you can tilt. This doesn't do, oh, it does lock actually, I take that back. So this is a lot, one that will, so you can then, when you get it to the correct uh, tilt, you just lock it in place. There we go. And if you want to record your angle of tilt on the front here of this mechanism, there's a degree finder, so you can record that. Then on the bottom, if you want to use some swing in your image, wrong way, we can make it swing, and the same locking mechanism also controls your shift, so we can come up with a setting that we really like there, and we're set for that. And then again, also, this has a, a shift here and a swing here finder, so you can figure out how many millimeters of shift and how many degrees of swing you have. And it's always a good idea if you carry a field notes book with your 4x5 to record that data so you can see the results of using your swing, shift, and tilt capabilities with this camera when you get your image back, and you can see whether it's successful or pleasing. Also, it will help you learn what worked and what didn't work for different situations so that as you get better, you can do it more naturally and more quickly. So let's get back to zero. This has zero detents at, for everything. So whenever you get back to your neutral posi position in any movement that this has, rise, fall, swing, shift, tilt, all of that, there's a zero detent so that you will know reliably that you are at neutral. And again, with the rise and the fall, you can loosen these, drop the back, loosen these, raise the top, and get a significant amount of rise and fall. Oh, that's getting a little bit loose. You need to start turning it the other way with your SCN2. I mean, look, this is, honestly, I, I can't think of a situation other than taking a picture of a skyscraper from its parking lot that you would need to use anything that's even close to this much rise and fall. This is a huge, huge amount. We'll loosen these back up, bring it back down to its zero detent, loosen these, zero detent, tighten, tighten, everything is tight, there we go. And that is how you use all of the movements on this camera. So now what we're gonna do is go through the process of taking a very, very basic photo with this camera. We're not gonna talk about how to use movements. All that's gonna be in separate future videos. This is just looking at how to take a picture with this camera, and then we'll look at how to do a double exposure. So one of the first mandatory things you're gonna to need to take a picture of with this camera is a lens. Let's pretend I have a lens mounted on here. Next thing you're gonna need is film. Right here, we've got film. Okay, I'm not gonna set that on the bellows. I don't need that. We're next gonna need a dark cloth because we need to have this so that we can look at the screen and get enough contrast and cut out enough ambient light to be able to see what's on the screen and focus properly. A magnifying loop right here so that we can hold this up against the screen and get fine focus, okay? And these are really precise cameras. When you use extensions and movements, it can throw off your metering. So if you've seen my anniversary graphic video where I talk about how I just eyeball lights, set light in scenes with that camera, I don't do that with a monorail. I do carry a light meter for monorail photography because adjusting this beyond infinity focus quickly, especially with wide angle lenses, um, rule of inverse squares cuts a lot of light out. It does that with the anniversary graphic as well, but because there aren't movements, it's easier to calculate. When you move a lens up and down or tilt it or shift it or swing it, what happens is you're not staying on the lens's vertical axis anymore. And that means that you, can't, you will 
be getting more of the side light of the lens, which will affect your exposure because if you've ever seen a picture of light drop, the further you get away from the center of a lens's image circle, the dimmer the image gets. It's different on different lenses how much that is. But if you're lined up here with your image circle, then you're gonna get suitable light. But if you move it off to the side, then what's happening is what's over here is gonna be much dimmer. So things like central gradient filters and light meters become much, much more important when doing 4x5 photography with movements and maybe someday I'll be good enough to gauge that. That day ain't today. So, we're gonna take a picture with this camera. Mount your lens on the front, take your light meter reading. We're gonna know our settings ahead of time. If we're in the studio, we know they're not gonna change. If we're out in the field, unless a cloud moves in or departs while we're doing all this, they shouldn't change all that much. So once we know what our light meter reading tells us, we can then determine our shutter speed and aperture. If you're going to do movements, then you can compensate those and that setting with once you know the movements and though that data will be available uh, specific to your lens because it's different with different lenses and different focal lengths. We're gonna open up the preview of our lens so that light will shine through it and we're going to now focus. We'll take our dark cloth, which is white on the outside for thermal protection and dark on the inside to help absorb light so we can focus more easily. We put it over our head and over the camera. I like to wrap it around the camera like this to cut out as much light as possible. So I'm getting something, if your head is looking through it like this, I like to, to wrap it like this so that there's no light leaking in through the bottom as well. And then I'll shut my eyes for 10 to 15 seconds to let them adjust to the darkness. And that's gonna make the viewfinder image very, very, very bright. The viewfinder image is going to be upside down and reversed, which means that it's going to take a little while, if you've never done this before, to get used to how you have to move the camera to get your framing correct. Once you have your framing correct, you can use your movements to focus if you need to. Then you're going to close the preview on your leaf shutter lens, you're going to make sure that your shutter setting and your aperture are correct. You'll put your film back into the camera You'll pull out the dark slide and either leave it in just a little bit, not covering the film, but just enough that it doesn't fall out. Or you'll take it out if you have a lot of confidence in your dark slide. Take your picture, put your dark slide back in. That's the process. It's really, really simple to do that. It's just that the refinements about how to use the camera can become really complicated. And if you are curious about how the rule of inverse squares affects light levels in your bellows when you extend the bellows past infinity, there, is, there are apps on the um, Google and iPhone app stores that will allow you to calculate your light loss and your exposure compensation by bellows extension and by um, the uh, I don't know if they calculate movement or not, but they will at least allow you to do it with by your focal length of your lens. One thing I wish this camera had is that it doesn't have any indication of length built into the monorail. So you've either got to guess that or bring like a tape measure with you, even if it's just one of those little roll-up tape measures you can get for you know, a couple bucks or whatever at a hardware store. That's pretty much close enough. And they're small and lightweight. It's not like you need anything longer than two feet anyway. So that's how you take a, a single exposure. Double exposures on this camera are super, super easy. To take a double exposure with the SCN2, everything you're gonna do to control it is gonna be done in your lens. So let's say that you have a, an exposure that's 1 1 25th of a second at f5.6, and that's your proper exposure. If you want to do a double exposure, you have to have half as much light for each of the two exposures when it reaches your film. The reason for that is 
if you have two proper exposures reaching your film, it's gonna be super dense. You're not gonna get the result you want. It's gonna be a little bit muddy and low contrast. So you, even with a double exposure, you want to have your image be what's effectively a proper exposure. So if we know it's 1 1 25th of a second and F5, 6, then there are two different ways you can control the amount of light reaching your lens, or your, your film rather, coming through your lens to achieve a double exposure. You can either double the shutter speed, which would be going to 1 2 50th of a second, which cuts the amount of light in half. Even though the number is higher, it's a fraction, so it's half as much. That's my preferred way because I prefer to use depth of field to, as a creative uh, aspect of the image, more so than shutter speed most of the time. If you're doing something with like waterfalls or runners and you have to have a certain shutter speed to capture the way that movement is, then by all means use aperture to, con to control your exposure. You would go to 1 2 50th of a second, you would take your first exposure, click, recompose your image or whatever you need to do. If your shutter speed later is 1 8th of a second, you'd again cut that in half for your second second part of your double exposure, go to 1 15th, take your picture, and now you've got your double exposure. You don't have to have a double exposure that's using the same settings in the same situation every time. You could take one photo on your, one part of your double exposure in your film back, let it sit for hours or days or a couple weeks or however long until you're able to take your second part of your double exposure, assuming that you have this whole thing planned out well in advance and then come in, take your different light readings, and just remember to cut the amount of light that the proper exposure has in half to finish your double exposure. And that can be a really, really powerful and neat and creative technique because you can use double exposures to do different things over a large span of time. Another thing you can do double exposures with, let's say you're into architectural photography. All right, so I've got this building lined up here I'm gonna take a picture of. I'm going to have a very close to proper exposure. If the light meter is telling me that I need one five hundredth of a second at F22, I might do one five hundredth of a second at F16, I'm sorry, at F32. And that would give me one stop less light, or I might cut the, split the difference and do something halfway between 22 and 32. Not enough that uh, the image would be underexposed meaningfully by itself. Take the first picture, say it's mid-afternoon or sunset, right? Come back some number of hours later after dark when all the lights are on in the building. Don't touch the camera, let it just stay there. Take a second picture, much longer exposure, and that way what you will do is capture the building in this perfect sunset lighting, and then the second exposure and the double exposure captures all the lights being on in the building, so you're also getting illumination within the building. It's sort of like a way of doing uh, HDR photography without having to do HDR photography. You're exposing once for proper exposure or near proper exposure, given the light that you have, and then you're coming back, and if you're only exposing for the lights on in the building and it's dark outside, it almost doesn't matter how long that exposure is as long as you don't overexpose the lights in the building. In that case, you could do two, two exposures that are at or very near proper exposure to get the intended effect. So the baseline that I always talk about with double exposures of cutting the exposure in half is true for most situations, but not all. So at any rate, um, there is another way to do double exposures with this camera. Let's say you wanted to do a mirror image double exposure. You're standing next to a bridge over water. The water is going to absorb a lot of light. And you line it up so that the water is right here in the middle of that, with that dashed line, okay? You can take your first photo at proper exposure value. Cover your film back with the dark slide. Take this guy out. You can now flip it around 180 degrees. Put the dark slide back in. Take your second photo. And if you've done it correctly, 
that horizon line should be in the same spot. And that bridge that was over on one of these sides and lit up would be that way on one image and that way on the other image. And so you'd have a double exposure that's a mirror image of itself flipped upside down. Because this has a film back that you can do that with. You can flip it 180 degrees. The only way you can't put it in is like this. That's not gonna work. But you can put it in landscape in either orientation and that lets you either be a lefty or take mirror image um, split horizon double exposure photos. So, so those are some of the creative double exposure things you can do with this camera. And I mean, realistically, it's not a complex camera. We've covered everything that was in the video outline and then a few additional things, in fact. But because of its design, it lets you be endlessly creative with the types of images that you can take. So if this video was helpful, please give me a thumbs up. That lets me know that I'm creating content which is helpful and useful to you and of benefit. If you would like to subscribe, you can do that below and be sure to turn on the notifications bell so that you know when I have future videos coming out. If you have a comment or question, please leave those below. I'm pretty good about responding fairly quickly. If you have suggestions or ideas for future videos, please let me know and I'm more than happy to do that if I have the ability and the equipment and the technical know-how. And one last thing, thank you everybody for watching and I'll see you in the next videos.